Number three, John Lesko and Michael Travaglia. John Lesko was born in November 1958 in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. Lesko never knew his father. He was one of six children, all from different fathers. Lesko's mother neglected her children. She sent them out to steal. Men she sexually knew abused Lesko and his brother. The burden of motherhood ended up being too much for his mother. She placed him and his brother in an orphanage when he was around eight. While in the orphanage's care, Lesko's brother was sexually abused. Lesko stayed in the orphanage for a few years. When he was 14, he went to live with his grandmother. As an adult, Lesko served in the Marines for about two years. He was dishonorably discharged after going AWOL in 1978. When he returned to Pittsburgh in 1979, Lesko bounced from job to job. In November of that year, Lesko met Michael Travaglia while working at the Elgini Airport. Travaglia had lived a relatively typical life. He was an average student and played saxophone in the school band. However, his father was strict and his religious mother was often emotionally detached. Travaglia believed his parents favored his older brother. Together, Lesko and Travaglia bonded with drugs and alcohol. They also allegedly tortured animals. Lesko's anger would eventually go beyond that. He wanted to lash out a world that he felt was so cruel to him and his brother. On December 27, 1979, Lesko and Travaglia, both 21 years old, claimed their first victim at downtown Pittsburgh Hotel. While in the bar, the pair believed that 49-year-old Peter Lovato had made a sexual pass at Travaglia. The men lured Lovato into the parking lot and forced the unemployed security guard into the trunk of his car. Then they drove to the Loyal Hannah Creek. They tried leaving him in the trunk and pushing the car into the water, but Lovato managed to escape. The men hunted him down and shot him twice in the head and once in the chest. His body was found two days later. Four days later, on January 1st, 1980, 26-year-old Marlene Newcomer picked up Lesko and Travaglia as she left a New Year's Eve party. The pair were hitchhiking on Route 66 around 1.30 a.m. when the single mother offered them a ride. They handcuffed her and took her car to Indiana County where they held up a convenience store. The police found her body in her car in a downtown Pittsburgh parking garage the next day. She had been shot to death. On the day Newcomer's body was found, Lesko and Travaglia struck again. 32-year-old William Nichols, a church organist, had recently purchased a new sports car. Travaglia, Lesko, and another person, Ricky Rutherford, a 15-year-old runaway, waited in the alley near his car. The three men surprised Nichols as he climbed into his car. Travaglia shot Nichols in the arm, then they all got into the car and took off. During the drive, Lesko beat and taunted Nichols, calling him queer and asking him if he wanted to perform oral sex on them. Lesko punched Nichols until he lost consciousness. When they pulled into a wooded area, the men gagged Nichols with a scarf. The men also handcuffed Nichols and tied his leg with a belt. Rutherford went looking for a rock. Lesko and Travaglia beat and tortured Nichols. Then they dragged his body to a hole in the ice that was covering Blue Spruce Lake. Rutherford had found a rock and they used it to weigh his body down. Nichols' body was pulled from the icy river a few days later. Early on the morning of January 3rd, Lesko, Trevelia, and Rutherford cruised the outskirts of Pittsburgh in Nichols' stolen sports car. The trio drove past Leonard Miller, an Apollo police officer, stationed in his patrol car outside of a convenience store. Travaglia, who was driving, tried to get Miller's attention by speeding past him and beeping the horn. It took three attempts for the sports car to get the officer's attention. Officer Miller chased after the man. He managed to force the car off the road. As Miller approached on the foot, Travaglia rolled down the window and shot Miller twice with a 38 caliber pistol. The officer returned fire to the car, shattering the passenger side of the windshield. 
The three men sped off as Miller radioed for help. The 21-year-old police officer died at the scene. Miller had only been a full-time officer for three days. After the shooting, the men returned to Pittsburgh. They hid the gun with a friend. The friend turned the gun over to the police, who arrested Lesko and Trevalia later that evening. The men admitted to killing the officer. Lesko and Trevalia were jointly tried in January 1981. Their defense strategy was to avoid first-degree murder by claiming the killing of Officer Miller was not premeditated. They claimed the shooting was accidental as the gun's hammer slipped as Trevelia aimed at the officer. Ricky Rutherford, the third man in the car, had his charges dropped in exchange for testifying against Lesko and Trevelia. In early 1981, a jury found the men guilty of first-degree murder. On February 3, 1981, Lesko and Trevelia were given death sentences for Miller's murder. They were to die in the electric chair. Lesko and Trevelia also pleaded guilty to the murders of Lovato, Nichols, and Newcomer. Over the next 40 years, Trevelia's execution was scheduled and then stayed four times by three different governors. In 1996, an appeals court vacated his death sentence. However, the courts reinstated that sentence in 2005. In prison, the two men became religious. Trevelia would never see his death sentence go through. He died of natural causes in 2017. He was 59 years old. Lasco's death sentence was scheduled and stayed over five times. In 1991, his death sentence was vacated by the appeals court, only to be reinstated in 1995. At the time of this video, Lesko remains on death row. During his appeals, he has argued his defense was ineffective for not letting him testify and some of the evidence was unavailable to his lawyers. He can take his case to the Supreme Court. John Lesko is one of Pennsylvania's longest serving death row inmates. Officer Leonard Miller is still remembered in the community. Monuments, buildings, and scholarships have been created in his name. And more than 40 years after his death, a memorial service is held every five years. Number 2. Christopher Worrell and James Miller James Miller was born in 1940 in Australia. He had five siblings. He left home at an early age. When he was 11, he was sent to the McGill Reform School. Outside the school, he resorted to theft and labor jobs to get by. As the years passed, Miller was convicted for more than 30 instances of car theft, robbery, and stealing. Miller spent most of his life in prison. During a three-month prison stint for breaking into a gun shop, Miller met Christopher Worrell, who was awaiting trial for rape charges. 34-year-old Miller, a gay man, was infatuated with 20-year-old Worrell. The two became friends after sharing a cell. Worrell claimed he never knew his father, and his mother remarried when he was six. He also claimed to have served in the Royal Australian Air Force. An Australian judge sentenced Worrell to four years for rape, and another two years for breaching his suspended sentence. Miller was released after serving his three-month sentence, but the pair were reunited when Miller was sent back to prison for stealing 4,000 pairs of sunglasses and selling them to local hotels. Although they weren't cellmates, Miller and Worrell remained close in prison. But once they were both released, the two would frequently visit each other. Worrell considered himself straight, but allowed Miller to perform oral sex on him as he read bondage magazines. The sexual relationship eventually fizzled, and the two became, quote, more like brothers, unquote. However, their dominant, submissive dynamic remained. Although Worrell was the younger man, he was the dominant one. Miller was quiet, while Worrell was young, handsome, and charismatic. They eventually shared an apartment and worked as laborers together. The friendship wasn't always perfect. Worrell had fits of rage, or black moods, as Miller called them. Around this time, Worrell, who was now 23, and Miller, who was 27, would drive around Adelaide, and Worrell would pick up women. 
Roll would find a young woman, and they would take her to a remote spot. Miller would go on a walk, leaving Worrell and the woman alone. While they were gone, Worrell would tie the women up and rape them. Miller would return, and they dropped the girl off in town. Sometimes, Miller would sleep in the car overnight while Worrell hung out in his girlfriend's apartment. On December 23, 1976, Worrell met 18-year-old Veronica Knight in front of the Majestic Hotel. Knight had become separated from her friend and accepted a ride from the men. Worrell managed to talk Knight into taking a hike into the Adelaide foothills. As usual, Miller went for a walk, leaving the two alone. When he returned half an hour later, he found Knight fully clothed and unresponsive. Worrell admitted to raping and killing the woman. Miller angrily confronted Worrell about the murder, but when he grabbed Worrell by the shirt, Worrell pulled out a knife and threatened to kill him. This move frightened Miller. The two took her body to a wooded area in Turo. They covered Knight's body with leaves and brush. They reported to work the next day. On January 2nd, 1977, Miller dropped off Whirl at a local mall. When he returned, he found Whirl was 15-year-old Tanya Kenny, whom he had met on the street. Kenny had just hitchhiked from Victor Harbor. They drove Kenny to her sister's house to pick up some clothes. After Whirl realized no one else was in the house, he followed her inside. While in the house, Whirl tied the young woman up and strangled her to death. Worrell called Miller inside, and then another violent argument ensued. The men stashed Kenny's body in a cupboard and left. They returned later that evening and collected Kenny's body. They buried Kenny's body in a shallow grave behind a rifle range. On January 21st, 1977, Miller and Worrell continued their pattern of picking up young women. This time they found 16-year-old Juliet Makita waiting for a bus on the steps of the Ambassador Hotel. Like the other young girls, Worrell convinced Makita to take a ride. The car pulled into its usual spot, and as Miller started to walk away, Makita managed to free herself from Worrell, tying her up. Worrell attacked Makita, then strangled her with the rope. Miller attempted to stop the attack, but his friend threatened to kill him if he did. Miller relented and walked away. When he returned, Whirl had packed her body into the back of the car. The men took her body to Truro and buried it behind a farmhouse. On February 6, Miller and Whirl picked up 16-year-old Sylvia Pittman as she waited for a train at the Adelaide station. When Miller returned from his walk, he found Pittman covered with a rug. Whirl had strangled her with her pantyhose. They buried her body in Truro. Worrell asked Miller to pick him up at the alley post office the next day. When he arrived, he noticed Worrell was with 26-year-old Vicki Howell. Howell was older than the other young women had recently separated from her husband. Miller liked the woman and secretly hoped that Worrell wouldn't kill her. Miller eventually left the pair, believing that Worrell wouldn't kill her. When he returned, he found Howell covered in a blanket. Worrell had strangled her as well. Miller was upset that Worrell had killed Howell, yet he helped bury her under some foliage in Turo. On February 9th, Miller and Worrell were driving around when they saw 16-year-old Kanye Ordiadides standing and laughing to herself. The man made a U-turn to pick her up. Ordiadides got scared as the car went in the opposite direction. Worrell pulled the teenage girl into the back seat as she kicked and screamed. Like the previous murders, Miller walked away. When he returned, he found that Worrell had raped and murdered the young woman. He was too afraid to confront Worrell as they dumped her body in some brush in Turo. On February 12th, Miller and Worrell picked up 20-year-old hitchhiker Deborah Lamb near Pinball Arcade. The men took Lamb to a beach at Port Grawler. When Miller returned from his usual walk, Lamb was gone and Worrell was covering a hole with sand. Worrell had strangled her with pantyhose, but the medical examiner later found sand and shell grit lodged in Lamb's lungs, so it's believed that she was buried alive. 
On February 19th, Worrell was driving with Miller and their friend, 21-year-old Debbie Skews. Worrell had been drinking, and he was driving recklessly down the highway. He lost control of the car. The car careened into oncoming traffic, and then Worrell jerked the car onto the side of the road, flipping it numerous times. The crash threw all three riders from the car. 23-year-old Christopher Worrell and 21-year-old Debbie Skews were killed instantly. Miller was hospitalized with a shoulder injury. Over 51 days, not including Debbie Skews, Christopher Worrell, with the help of James Miller, murdered seven women. Miller became depressed after Worrell's death because his only friend was gone. Miller jumped in the open grave at the funeral, leaving a picture for his friend. He declared his love for Worrell and asked for forgiveness. Miller spent the next few years living in abandoned cars and homeless shelters. On April 25, 1978, more than a year after the murders and Worrell's death, two mushroomers stumbled upon the bones of what they thought was a cow. Upon further investigation, they found a shoe with a human foot inside of it. These were the remains of Veronica Knight, the first victim. Four bushwhackers stumbled upon more human remains a year after that discovery, about half a mile from Knight's remains. It was the body of Sylvia Pittman, the fourth victim. The police had been investigating the missing girls for a long time, and after the two bodies were found in the Turo area, the police suspected they were connected. The area was searched by 70 officers. They found the remains of Vicki Howell and Connie Arandes. Although the police had found four of the missing women, they still had few clues to work with. They appealed for the public for help, offering a $30,000 reward. A woman identified by the name of Angela came forward with information. Angela was later revealed to be Amelia, Rose's girlfriend at the time of his death. Her full name was never made public. She told the police that Miller confessed the murders at Worrell's funeral. Miller told Amelia that Worrell had a blood clot that caused him to lash out. Amelia did come forward at the time of Miller's confession because there was no proof that the murders happened. But once the bodies turned up, she decided to go to the police. The police detained James Miller on May 23, 1979. Although there was no physical evidence tying him to the murders, the police got a confession from Miller after six hours of questioning. He took the police to the bodies of the remains of the last three victims. Miller stood by as Worrell raped and murdered these women. In most cases, Miller believed Worrell wouldn't kill them. However, he was so in love and afraid of Worrell, he let him continue his killing spree. Miller pleaded not guilty as February 1980 trial. The case was interesting because Miller did not physically participate in the murders, but he was still tried for them. However, the only person who could defend him was dead. On March 12, 1980, James Miller was found guilty on six counts of murder. He was not found guilty in the first case of Veronica Knight because he was unaware that Worrell was going to kill her. He was given six life sentences without parole for 35 years. Miller protested the sentence in 1984 by going on a 43-day hunger strike. It didn't work and he remained in prison. James Miller died of cancer in prison in October 2008. He died at age 68. He was one of Australia's longest serving inmates. Number 1. Myron Lance and Walter Kelbach By 1966, Myron Lance and Walter Kelbach had a history of violence and drug use and they had already served time in prison. Both men were labeled, and I quote, aggressive homosexuals. Unquote. They were also each other's cousins and lovers. On December 17, 1966, 25-year-old Lance and 28-year-old Kalbach stopped for gas at a Texaco service station in Salt Lake City, Utah. Both were under the influence of wine and pills. The only employee working that night was 18-year-old Stephen Shea. 
Lance and Kalbach impulsively drew their guns on Shea and they stole $147 out of the register. The men then drove Shea out to the desert, stripped the teenager, and took turns raping him. In a sick twist, Lance and Kalbach flipped a coin to see who would kill Shea. Kalbach won and stabbed Shea five times in the chest. He left his body on the desert road. The next night, Lance and Kalbach kidnapped another gas station attendant. This time, it was 18-year-old Michael Holtz. Like Shea, the men took turns raping Holtz. And like Shea, they flipped coins to see who would kill him. Lance won and stabbed Holtz with the same knife they used to kill Shea. Kalbach also took turns stabbing him. Both men had stabbed him five times. They dumped his body on the side of Interstate 80. The bodies were found and the police were called. The police had little evidence to work with. After the murders, the Salt Lake police ordered all gas stations to be closed at midnight. Local service stations added second employees and armed them with guns and tear gas. On December 21st, Lance and Kalbach jumped in a cab heading to Salt Lake City Airport. The driver, Grant Strong, radioed the office because he was suspicious of the men. At the time, dispatchers had created a code for drivers to use in case of trouble. Strong's supervisor told him to tap the microphone twice if he was in trouble. As the cab headed towards the airport, Kalbach pulled out a gun and held it to Strong's head as he demanded money. Strong tapped the microphone twice as instructed. That's when Kalbach shot the 30-year-old driver in the head. Kalbach would later tell a reporter, I just pulled the trigger and blood flew everywhere. Oh boy, I've never seen so much blood. Police found Strong's body in the cab moments later. Meanwhile, Lance and Kalbach fled to Lolly's Tavern near the airport. The men acted casually. Both Kalbach and Lance were in the tavern earlier that evening. One of them won a tape recorder as a prize for bowling. As Kalbach played pinball, Lance walked up to the bar and shot 47-year-old James Sizemore in the head. Lance ordered the manager, Lloyd Graven, to empty the till, and Graven did as he was told and handed over $300 to Lance. Lance and Kalbach turned their guns on the manager and the four patrons. In the gunfire, two patrons, 20-year-old Fred Lilly and 34-year-old Beverly Mace, were shot. Lilly was killed instantly and Mace died a few days later from her injuries. A third patron, Roma Diaz, was shot and survived. The fourth patron was unharmed. The manager, Lloyd Graven, grabbed his pistol and returned fire at the men. The men shot back at close range, narrowly missing the manager. He pretended to be dead as the shooters ran for the building. They retrieved their car and drove off, but the police stopped them at a roadblock around 2 a.m. Both men were charged with first-degree murder. Shortly after being arrested, they were connected with the other three murders. The two men went to trial in April 1967 for the three tavern murders. During the trial, Lloyd Graven and Verón Medias identified them as the shooters. A jury quickly found them guilty and they were sentenced to death. At the time, in Utah, condemned prisoners could choose how they wanted to be executed. Lance chose the firing squad while Kalbach wanted to be hanged. In 1968, the men broke out of prison. But authorities caught them less than 24 hours later. In 1977, the United States Supreme Court found that the death sentence was unconstitutional and their sentences were commuted to life in prison. Life sentences made them eligible for parole. The men were denied parole in 1992. The parole board recommended that the men spend the rest of their lives in prison. Lance said, I think the hearing has been a waste of your time as well as mine. I see there's no possible way I'll ever be granted a release and if I were in their shoes, I would feel the same way as they do. Neither man showed remorse for the six murders they committed over four days. I haven't any feelings towards the victims, Lance said in an interview with NBC. I don't mind people getting hurt because I like to watch, Kelbach added. 
In August 2010, Myron Lance died of natural causes. He was 69 years old. Eight years later, Ulrich Hellback died of natural causes. He was 80 years old. 51 of those years were spent in prison. Thank you so much for watching today's video. Please don't forget to check out our new channel, Paranormally Listed. There's a link on the screen now, and there's a link in the description box below this video. Well, that's all for today. Thanks again for watching.